<laughs> Follow along. Uh, so who am I? Uh, I'm a developer advocate at Google, representing cloud products. So App Engine is only one cloud product. We have a few more, and you'll hear about that in the talk. I've uh, been a software engineer for over 20 years. And uh, I did the email, and I've worked at some big companies that like to write, like to teach. And maybe I will see you guys at CB Soft tomorrow. Maybe. Anybody going to CB Soft? No. Because you all graduated, like I even say, making a real salary instead of being a poor student. All right. If you know anybody that's going to CB Soft, I'm giving a, a closing keynote, a international keynote there too. Um, and it has all kinds of stuff, Python, programming, uh, cloud computing, things like that. So that's tomorrow. All right, so this is to start you off. What is cloud computing? So you know what it is and where everything fits. So then I can explain where App Engine goes. Uh, so cloud computing is uh, on-demand and networked access. So you have resources that are on the net. Uh, it is shared. You have to share with other people, other applications. And you can provision and release. You can get it, and you can release it when you don't need it anymore. Okay, so that's the basic definition of cloud computing. Uh, so, but the concept has been around for a long time, since 1984, when Sun said the network is a computer. And that is true, because all of these computing resources are available to you regardless of where it is located. Okay, but. Back at that time, the world was not ready for cloud computing yet because it was too expensive. Now, we have better networking, we have lots of machines everywhere, lots of cheap computers, cheap disks everywhere. So now, it's more possible to do. So it all started from Amazon.com, basically, uh, the, current, you know, the current incarnation of making it a public thing. So Amazon, you know, they sell books, they sell movies and music everywhere. And um, so they have to buy enough machines. Okay, so in America, or in the US, we have Thanksgiving holiday, and so it's supposed to be the day after Thanksgiving is the biggest shopping day for Christmas. And so Amazon had to buy enough machines to be able to survive that, right? A lot of machines, a lot of disks, big networking uh, because of the, the Christmas shopping. But what are all those machines doing you know, in July, nothing, right? Nothing, they're, they're sitting there, okay? So it's costing them a lot of money, so maybe we can sublease, we can rent uh, the, uh, you know, all of this computing power and maybe get some of the cost back, right? Because it's very expensive to buy these things. So that kind of started the whole, you know, uh, commercialized cloud computing. Uh, and then other big companies realize that too, you know, Microsoft, Google, we all have lots of computers, right? They're all not doing anything either. So <laughs> at least you don't think they're doing something, right? So why don't we sell it to the public? Uh, but Google has actually a, a, even a, a more interesting approach. It's like, uh, in, on top of those resources, we have built a lot of stuff to help run the company. We have really good algorithms to do searching. We have. Uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, build our own internal this, internal tools for that. Um, so we're basically trying to make them available to the public. So uh, that's really one of the main things that we're trying to do. And I'll show you that uh, later in this presentation. All right, so what are the main reasons why you would consider cloud computing? Um, there's less cost because you may not have to buy all those machines anymore. You're just only going to rent what you need. Uh, and if it is elastic, so you can stretch and shrink depending on the need. So if you are doing, you know, shopping, maybe around November time, you know, you need more resources. But you know, in the summertime, or actually that's summer for you guys, the winter time, you use less, so you don't use that much, and so you don't have to pay as much. Uh, automated, you can, uh, you don't have to worry about, you know, like, uh, you know, if you rent out machines, um, hopefully you, you have a, a management system that will manage upgrades and patches so that you don't have to worry about it. Uh, should be very flexible. You, you know, if somehow you need it now, instead of waiting till November, you should be able to get it now. When you finish, you can give it back. Uh, so um, you, uh, it's also more global. You can access your services all over the world. And really the main idea, one of the main ideas is that you really can just worry about the solution you're trying to create instead of having to be a sysadmin, instead of having to be you know, watching out for hardware and things like that that are not really that uh, 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 plays a big role in your solution. So the main 
idea is uh, more focus on your business and less on having to take care of hardware. All right. So supposed to be next year, one fifth, twenty percent of all the largest two thousand companies in the world should be using cloud, uh, public cloud computing services. So we will see if that is true. So that was made uh, almost two years ago. All right. So another uh, uh, another uh, U.S. Uh, analyst company called Gartner. They categorize cloud computing into these three uh, areas: software as a service. That means you have an application that you have to have a web browser to use. You know, when you're checking your Yahoo Mail or your Gmail or your Google Docs or your Salesforce, you have to use a browser. You have to be connected to the internet to use those applications. That's software as a service. You have no control over the software. You have no control over the operating system or the hardware or anything. You have no control over anything except for maybe your configuration settings for your uh, for your account that you create. Okay. At the bottom layer is infrastructure as a service. Infrastructure is where you're going to rent machines, disk, networking, hardware, cooling, things like that, very low level stuff. From that bottom level, you have to worry about everything that goes on top of that. So operating system, database server, web server, load balancing, uh, monitoring, reporting, analyzing, all those things that you have to worry about for infrastructure as a service. But all of those things that I just said is not your application. Those are things that your application needs to use in order for it to work. But you're still responsible for it, even if it is not your application. Okay, So that's one of the problems with infrastructure is that you have to worry about all of these things that is not your application. Okay, So in the middle is platform as a service. So I think that is the most powerful one of all, not because that's where Appleton is or whatever, okay? But because you don't have to worry about all the infrastructure stuff, operating system, database, web server, all those things that I just said, those things are taken care of for you. You don't have to worry about it. But it's more powerful than software as a service because you control the app. You make it happen. You know, with software as a service, you have no control over the app. But with platform as a service, you build the app and you run it. In fact, you use platform as a service to write SaaS apps, right? You are using the platform to create an app that's available to your users, but your users can't update the code, right? So you don't have to worry about infrastructure as a service, and you use platform as a service to write software as a service applications, okay? So that's where AppEngine fits in, and then there's other ones like Force.com, and also Microsoft has Azure. So uh, those things all do something similar. You create the app, you upload it to these platforms, and these platforms will run it for you. And you don't have to worry about all of the lower level stuff with the infrastructure. Okay? Everybody understand? Yeah. Okay, good. Now we can talk about uh, app engine. So I mentioned all of these things at the infrastructure level. Okay? These things you have to take care of. One thing I didn't say is I didn't talk about licensing, uh, it costs money, uh, logging, and reporting, and monitoring, those things. I didn't mention all the other things I did. These things are a lot of work, and none of these things are your application. These are just tools that your application needs to use in order for it to run. So we want to take all those things and put it inside one box for you, called App Engine. It's easy to start because we always have a free, a free a service level that you can try it before you buy it. Okay, um, easy to scale. This is the best one. You don't really have to do too much. If as long as you have your app do a very fast request response cycle. So when a web browser hits your app, if you can respond very fast, the faster you respond to your users, the more scalable we uh, will let your app be. Okay, try to keep it less than 100 milliseconds is a best practice. Okay, if you have to make, if you have to, you know, take time to do extra work, then you know, try and use a background job or something, and I'll tell you about how to do that. Easy to maintain, so you control the source code. It's all yours. It should be in your source code a repository system. Uh, when you upload things to App Engine, we don't do source code control for you. You have to do it yourself. But we do give you some flexibility. So, for example, you have you know the next version, 1.1 of your software. You know it seems to be good. You upload it, it's live, and then it starts to crash. And then you go, oh no, now I have to go back to my my source code repository and pull all the files back from the last version and then upload it again. No, you don't have to do that. App Engine keeps the last 10 versions that you did. So you just go to your control panel and just click the previous version. You don't have to do too much work. 
Okay, so maintenance may, is made easier for you. So we have the beepers. I don't know if you wear beepers anymore. My, probably it's the cell phone now, the email to your cell phone, right? Uh, so uh, we have people that are uh, awake 24 times 7 so that you, you, you can sleep. Okay, other people will stay awake for you. So that's what you're paying for, right? You're paying for very smart people to watch over the machines to make sure your app is still running. Okay, focus on your app. Don't be a citizen. Unless that's your profession, it's okay if it's your profession. <laughs> All right, then you can come work for Google and be a professional assistant too, so that you can do that. All right. All right. So, what are the big pieces of app engine? There's Quattro, uh, SDK, the software development kit, the la uh, programming languages, uh, administration console, which is your control panel. Uh, and then your infrastructure. So let's start with the one that you have no control over, and that's the infrastructure, okay? So at Google, all of our machines uh, run some sort of customized Linux. We have a custom Google file system. Uh, it uses Bigtable, which is the non-relational database that we have, and you can read the paper on that. It's on, you just Google for that. Uh, and, then, uh, and then hardware, custom-made hardware. So these are the same machines that run all of Google. Maps, Gmail, search, it doesn't matter. Your app will actually run on the same machines in the same data centers as all of these other services. Okay. All right, so as far as language goes, we have Python and Java. Those languages are uh, considered batteries included because they have enough libraries in, in order for you to build an application. And then we just added Go four months ago, so that's the newest one. Uh, and because we do have Java, uh, once you have a JVM, you can actually run other languages, and I'll talk about that later. All right, so Python, of course, was the very first uh, runtime that was picked uh, when App Engine launched in 2008, three years ago. Uh, and you already know this because that's why you're here at Python for Seed. Uh, it's because it's the big ease of use, the king of ease of use. Very fast development, low barrier of entry. You do not need to be a computer science major in college to use Python very well. Lots of libraries and packages. Um, so that was why it was chosen. One year later, we added Java because Java is the king of enterprises everywhere in big companies, all right? Uh, so the Java app engine tries to stick to the servlet standard as close as possible. So if you already know how to do Java servlets, then it's not too different for you to learn how to use Java app engine. A lot of uh, libraries uh, uh, for software as well. If you are an Eclipse user for Java, you can, uh, there's a Google plugin that is uh, specially made by Google to help you with App Engine development as well as um, um, GWT, Google Web Toolkit development. Um, <coughs> if you'd like to use IntelliJ or NetBeans, uh, there's also uh, you know, App Engine uh, plugins for them too, but they're not maintained by Google, they're maintained by the companies. Uh, and then uh, other languages. So, uh, and then so Go uh, is a new one, so you can try that one. It has, uh, it has the same, you know, uh, reliability and power of a statically typed compiled language, okay? But it also has benefits of a dynamically typed language. So you can kind of think of it as a sort of a combination of Python and Java, okay? It has built-in concurrency, which is really good. Uh, it is compiled, but it has an automated garbage collection, okay? So you should just give it a try and see what you think. So I mentioned for Java users that we try to stick as close to the serverless standard as, as much as possible. So all of these standards, all the different JSRs, um, you know, we try to have an equivalent API. But you can also, uh, you know, when you look at the low-level App Engine API, they should look very similar to using all these things. In fact, JPL, J, JBA, uh, JPL, JPA, they're all, uh, pretty much identical. So they're, uh, that's. Um, those are the higher level ORM styles, but you can also use the low level uh, App Engine API. And there's also another low level API called Objectify that a lot of people like too. Okay. And as I mentioned before, because we have a JVM, we have other language support. So you can run Ruby on JRuby. There's also Scala and Groovy. You can run PHP and Quercus, Java, uh, JavaScript on Rhino. You can also run Python on Jython. So um, one thing I do want to say is that the PHP is, it, it is PHP, but you're not going to use like SQL like the way you normally would embed in a uh, PHP application. You still have to use JD or JPA, so it's a little bit different. The performance is pretty good still, okay? It's just that it's not the same as regular PHP programming. 
And then some people ask me, well, why would I want to use Python on top of the JVM when I can use the pure Python API? Well, the main reason is if you have a lot of uh, Java classes already and you don't want to have to port everything to Python, but your new code is written in Python, then you actually use Jython to kind of run both, right? Because some of you guys who already know Jython know that uh, your Python objects can talk to your Java objects because everything runs in the JVM anyway. So that's one of the main reasons why you would use Jython. Okay? All right, so web-based administration console. So uh, one of the things that I'm going to tell you about very soon is because you're, if you're running, doing cloud computing, your application is running on the same machines as everybody else. So I don't know if you trust the person sitting next to you, but you probably don't want them to get access to your code or your data, right? That's probably true. The same goes for them, all right? So you have to run in a sandbox, a restricted environment uh, that's more secure. And so the problem with this is you don't have full control. You don't have like a shell I can go in and download my Apache log and things like that, right? You can't do that, all right? So what we try to do is we created this administration console, this control panel, to try and give you something that you would build if it was, you know, you made the app completely on your own, okay? So um, the control panel shows you like how much network traffic you're getting, you know, how many <coughs> users are using your product. So like, you know, this one, the numbers are really small, but you can, this is, Point, like almost 0. 0.6 requests every second. So you're about getting like one web browser hitting your app every other second, okay? So that's not too bad because it's getting some users, all right? But that's at the peak, okay? Otherwise it's more quiet. Um, so with the dashboard, the control panel, you can see like, you know, how much free quota you're using, have you gone over your quota, how much money did you budget, how much is it, uh, have you, it cost you today, so that's a daily number, it changes every day, it resets every day. Um, it tells you like the errors that you're getting, what are the most number of errors and which URI is giving you those errors, uh, what are the most co uh, popular URIs that your users are hitting on your app. Uh, you can you know, set who your developers are, permissions, you do your billing settings here, you can look at your data, you can get access to your logs, you can also download your logs as well. So it has all these things. And the chart, there's different charts. You can also measure like how fast is your app? How many milliseconds is it taking your app to respond to users? How many errors per second is your app uh, experiencing? Things like that. So this is a pull down. There's a lot more charts that you can look at. Those are the things that you would have to build on your own. But because you're in a sandbox and you can't build it, we try to build it for you. Okay, so that's the uh, dashboard. Uh, the software development kit uh, gives you a local development server so you can like run your server uh, on your development machine and try it out before you actually you know test it before you upload it live to production because once you you know upload it live it's live to the world okay um, except maybe China where you know, maybe not always up but sometimes it's up okay. I have we have no control over that. Um, it's easy to deploy your application. It's, uh, if you're using, uh, you know, the uh, the UI that we do, or um, or the launch uh, the um, Eclipse, it's you, you press the button and you type in your credentials and then it uploads. Or you can do it from the command line too. You can also manage your versions, like which version should be the default one whenever users hit my URL. And then lots of different APIs, which I will talk about um, coming up later in this talk. All right. Now, before we talk about some of the features of AppEngine, let's just give you an idea of the type of applications that people write. That way you can determine whether or not AppEngine is the right thing for you, okay? Uh, so these are some of our users. Uh, so we're gonna talk about the current uses right now. Okay, so AppEngine is three years old. We're on our fourth year now, and you can see that the overall traffic has grown a lot. I know I don't have a lot of the numbers here, but you can just use your imagination. Um, what, what the traffic is like. The, basically, we're having really good adoption, a lot of traffic. We're always adding new features all the time. They're, they're at the team adds features so fast that I can't even keep up with it because it's every six to eight weeks or something new. Um, so there's just not a lot of time, especially when I'm going out to a conference talking to you guys. You know, they're making new releases and I'm not keeping up to date, so it's, it's kind of tricky. Uh, so. A lot of times when you ask Google, you know, how much this, how much that, a lot of times they say, oh, I'm sorry, we can't tell you, that's confidential, all right? But here are some numbers that I can tell you about that people have asked a lot, and that is how many users do you have? So how many people have AppEngine apps that they use every month? So these are people that log into their uh, administration console, or they upload a new version of their app, so they're active, okay? 
So every month we have more than 100,000 people around the world using App Engine. Uh, and then how many applications are active? Okay, active is important because you know you guys can all go and do the Hello World tutorial, and then the application just sits there and doesn't do anything, right? So these are apps that actually get traffic every week. Okay, so now, so that was developers per month. This is now app, active apps per week now. Okay, two hundred thousand, right? A lot of a, a lot of active apps. So let me ask you guys a question. So you know, I was to ask you to guess all the app engine apps put together in the whole world. How many page views a day do you think we get? How many? Hundreds of millions. About 1,500 billion. Okay, 1.5 billion page views a day of all apps. Okay, and keep in mind that all of these numbers are actually very low because these are our public numbers. Private numbers are higher. Okay, so that's every app put together every day. So we went developers per month. Apps per week, and now we're talking about page views every day. So that's one, you know, HTTP request and a get or a post. Okay. All right. So there's a lot of users um, around the world: Japan, Israel, America, um, Singapore, everywhere. Okay. I'm going to talk about this one and this one. These two today. So social networking, so there's this app called Buddy Poke. So if you guys like use Facebook or something, you know that there's, you know, poking somebody, you know, hey, what's going on, kind of a thing, right? Uh, so Buddy Poke is more than that. Is that you get an avatar, you know, you can dress them up, make them feel good, feed them, play with them, or something like that, right? So it's on all the major social networking platforms. So Orchid, Facebook, MySpace, High Five, they all have this app, all right? So, how many users does this application have? It has more than 64 million, this is old, this, there's more than 64 million registered users. So that means that there's more than 64 million objects in their database, okay? But just because you're a user doesn't mean you use it, right? So another important number is how many people use this application every day? How many people log into their little avatar every day? So 3.6 million on Facebook, 1.6 million on MySpace. So more than five and a half million daily active users. Daily active means you log into your app every day. Okay, so that's a more important number. Okay, so this, so their user base is growing, it's grown a lot. So that's one type of scale that you can get with App Engine. Another type of scaling is this company from Israel called Gidia. And what they do is they are like a contracting company and they make applications for like one-time events. You know, like maybe the World Cup or uh, you know American football or a Hollywood movie, something. They'll make this app. They'll get a lot of traffic, and then they throw it away and do another one. Okay. Of course, they reuse the same code, but that's the type of scale that they have. So remember how we looked at the uh, control panel? Uh, the control panel had um, you know like 0.6 users hitting the request per second. So that's about one every other second. So just remember that number, 0.6. So this app is uh, a, another app that is for their event. This number here is not 0.6 anymore. This number is 400. So 400 requests per second, 400 web browsers hitting your app every second. So, so this is an event. They maybe they told, put it on the news. So it went to 400 and it went to 800, and then the event starts and it goes all the way up to 1,600 requests per second. 1,600 web browsers hitting your app every second, every second, okay? And having your app stay up all the way, and of course, then the, app, the event finishes and it slowly goes down. Okay, so that's the other type of scale that you get with App Engine. It's crazy, okay? And I'll show you even more crazy. The wedding, whoops, okay? The wedding, all right? So I don't know how many of you guys stayed up late to watch the wedding, maybe only the girls, okay? There's no girls in this room, is there? One, two, okay. Not enough, right? Okay. Uh, so on the wedding day, the, uh, so one thing I should say is the official blog for the wedding is hosted, is an App Engine app.
And so on the wedding day, they had 2,000 requests per second. That's the block. 2,000. That's bigger than the 1,600, right? Per second. Uh, the live stream app is a YouTube app that was built on App Engine. They got up to 32,000 requests every second. Okay, and then when they had the, the beso, or I don't know how you say kiss, right? That went up another 10,000, so it was 42,000 requests a second. Every second, okay, it's crazy. Now that's crazy numbers, right? Okay, and a lot of uh, page views and a lot of visitors. And then there's a short link here. So the presentation will be uploaded on the website. You guys can get it. And just go to the link and you can read more about these numbers in, in the, the, the website. Uh, also, uh, big American companies, I don't know if you know, but big American companies have to report their uh, financial information to the government every quarter. And so, you know, can you imagine how fun and exciting it is to put all the numbers together in a way that you can give it to the government? Okay, not very exciting. So these guys build a web app in the cloud that lets them you know, just throw their CSV or their Excel files uh, and in the cloud, and then they'll automatically format everything and then send it to the government. So they have a lot of big customers, and these big customers are depending on this small company, and this small company is depending on AppEngine. So there's a lot of dependencies there. Okay, so they have to really trust AppEngine because these guys will be very, very bad if you mess up their financial numbers, right? Uh, so everything I told you so far was like web apps that have user-facing stuff, but I want to say that uh, App Engine is also good for non-user-facing apps. Like if you have an app running on a mobile phone, you know, if you have an app, you still have to make a decision. Do I host it myself or should I take it to the cloud? And I think you should do the cloud because you can give your users a better experience. You can have the high scores there, you can have the contacts there. Because you know, somebody might accidentally drop their phone or maybe you get mugged or something and your phone is gone. You lost all your high scores, you're crying for more than your phone. You're crying for your high scores, okay? So you want to give your users a good experience. So put that information in the cloud so when they get a new phone, they can get that information again. Or you can uh, let them look at their high scores using a web browser, all right? So I, so I think it's good, AppEngine is good for non-user facing web apps. All you need to do is make an HTTP, get a post, to talk to your app on App Engine, okay? So you don't have to have a UI. All right, so let's just run through the uh, features really quickly, because I know we're running out of time. Um, and then we'll talk about what's coming up. Okay, so remember you have to run in a sandbox. So we don't let you do things like, you can't open a socket, you can't open a file, you can't make an operating system call. But, but those things are really important to running applications, right? Why do you want to open a socket? Well, maybe I want to send email. Okay, well, instead of giving you sockets, AppEngine gives you higher level APIs, like sending and receiving email. So you can have your app send and receive email, instant messages. You can have IM uh, users instant message your app and you can respond. You can pretend, you know, you're, you're a person when you're not, right? Uh, if you have long-term tasks, okay, if you can't, okay, so we have a deadline of 30 seconds. Your request response has to be done in 30 seconds or else it gets killed. So, you, uh, if you want something to run longer, you can use task queues. A background job can run up to 10 minutes, all right? Um, there's database, a memcache, okay? Memcache is much faster than the database because the database is distributed everywhere. So if you have data that you need to access a lot, it's faster to use memcache. URL fetch is if you want to you know, talk to another web app. You know, we have images, so you can resize, rotate, crop images. Blob store is if you want to serve media files, you know, like, like audio, video, anything like up to two gigabytes in size. And then we have authentication. Not that fancy, but you know, you have to have authentication or else you have to roll your own. So one good news is that App Engine is going to become an official product. It's coming out of beta at the end of this year, which means the company believes in App Engine, so we're not going to be canceled. Okay, that's good, right? Uh, and so that means now App Engine can be committed to our users. So for some reason, if it does turn out that Google cancels it, we have a full three years before you know we stop the service. So there's a longer time. It's not like all of a sudden. Okay. Three classes of service, free, paid, and higher paid. So this is per application. If you have lots of apps, it may be better to have uh, the premium service because you get uh, better support, things like that. And then there's extra fee if you want to have a custom SSL. Um, so what else? Uh, let's see. So this is just talking about pricing as we become official. Pricing is more official. We're still less than other systems, uh, other competitive systems. Uh, but it's not like almost free like it is now, okay? Uh, but you get an SLA guaranteed uptime and you also get support for premium, so those things are better <coughs> to run a business. Um, oh yeah. 
So on the roadmap, these are the things we're working on. So Python 2.7 is coming out before the end of the year, so people are waiting for that. Uh, and then we'll think about Python 3 at some point. Uh, but if you want to read more about these other things we're coming out with, take a look at the roadmap. Uh, so one really quick last word I want to say about vendor locking. So some people think, oh, you're forced to using Google's APIs. Okay. Well, that's not quite true. Okay. But we try to fight that. But a lot of times you think that that we force you to use the APIs, you cannot get off the system. Right. So lock it is you can't move your app or your data off of it. So is it true for App Engine? Kind of. You don't really get something for nothing because we're trying to take advantage of Google's infrastructure. But the thing is. You have to write against Google APIs because it only runs on our machines, right? So how is Google fighting that? Well, you don't have to use Google APIs. So even though App Engine comes with a web framework, you don't have to use that. You can use Django, WebDepy, Tiffany or Bottle. Those other web frameworks work with App Engine. You don't have to use the Data Store API. If you write it in Django, you can do things the normal Django way using their ORM. As long as you run with Django non-rel, which talks to the back end, you can actually have an App Engine app that's Django, run it on App Engine, or if later on you don't like App Engine, you say, hey, I'll just take my app and move. Very easy. You can also get to your data. We have a data store bulk loader that will let you upload and download your data. And if you really want to run your own uh, App Engine-like system, because you know backend runs at Google, you can download these open source projects, which tries to be API compatible with App Engine. So if you really want full control, you can try those too. There's two. Uh, and then we're very we're compliant with security. All your app and your data is very secure. I can't even get into a data center without a vice president approval. Okay. So and then we're certified up to this international standards. Okay. So all of these things means your data is secure. Um, I don't have time to go over this, um, but uh, with App Engine app, you can actually roll your custom made App Engine app along with your existing Google apps. Okay. So that's really what this is trying to say. Um, when you roll your app engine app in, it'll go under your app's control panel, just like Gmail, Google Calendar, your app will just show up here. So you can actually make this part of your uh, entire uh, uh, service that you provide to your employees. And then Google App Engine is also a way to get uh, access to other Google uh, Cloud services like storage, BigQuery, prediction, you can talk to me about those outside. But it's just a gateway to get you into other, uh, uh, other cloud services. All right, so why App Engine, blah, 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 all these good things I told you about. Um, all right, thank you very much. Obrigado, Brasil. Yep, any quick questions? We have time for one question, at least. Does anyone have anything? Just one or two. What's the Portuguese class? No one has the Portuguese. So somebody will translate for you. So ask in Portuguese. Uh, in relation to the cost, the price is said to be nine euros. For uh, applications that use a lot of media, video, many photos, the limitation of the disc is nine euros. The right to buy a contract is nine euros. So this, uh, uh, what happens is for data storage, you get one gigabyte of data storage for free, and then everything after that you pay, uh, you know, per gigabyte. So if you go to the URLs that I have earlier, you can actually see what some of those quarters are right here. So you can see the pricing, and then FAQ is here for the pricing. You can also see the current quotas, which is almost free, <laughs> but it'll, it'll be for uh, real cost. Right? Uh-huh. And one more, probably one more. No? Okay. Obrigado. All right, thank you.